Hello friend, thanks for joining me for another book chat. Today let's spend a few minutes with this fun little book, The Usefulness of Useless Knowledge by Abraham Flexner. This essay itself, The Usefulness of Useless Knowledge, was originally published in 1939 in Harper's Magazine by Abraham Flexner. But this particular edition, published in 2017, has a companion essay called World of Tomorrow by Robert Dykraff, and I may be mispronouncing that name. And this, that essay actually provides some context to the usefulness of useless knowledge, which has sort of become a classic essay. So that essay came out, um, as I mentioned, in 1939. So for those who aren't aware, 1939 was at the year of the World's Fair in Queens, New York, and the World's Fairs used to be a really big deal. None other than Albert Einstein gave a demonstration of cosmic rays during this particular fair. And the fair also saw demonstrations of a dishwasher, air conditioning, and television. And I think the television was demonstrated by the president, Franklin Roosevelt, himself. But missing from the fair, that essay, World of Tomorrow, points out, was two very important technologies which were about to come to dominate uh, the world. Uh, nuclear energy, and uh, electronic computers. And both of those technologies had their beginnings at the Institute of Advanced Studies, which also had been the academic home of Einstein since 1933. And the Institute of Advanced Studies at the time of this essay, Albert Abraham Flexner was the director of and sort of had actually uh, developed actually into an institution and more on that here in a bit. But Ab just a bit about Abraham Flexner. I think he's kind of an interesting person. He was an education reformer in the early 20th century and his Flexner report was a report of medical, the medical, educa medical education system in the United States and Canada. And it really revolutionized medical schools uh, throughout North America then after that. And the legacy of that's debated today. I was seeing uh, some information about that. But in this chat, we're really only going to talk about this particular essay more so than the uh, author, Abraham Flexner. So I think the basic idea of this essay can be boiled down to knowledge is valuable for its own sake. So insights into one problem expands our understanding and it's not really possible to predict where that understanding is going to take us as an individual or take the future like our insight in an in a academic sense might not seem to be meaningful during our lifetime, but in the future, somebody else picks that up and adds to it, or it provides a key to their research that they're working on. So uh, Abraham Flexner envisioned creating this space at Princeton, the Institute of Advanced Studies, where scholars could, were free, really, to study anything at all, and with no regard, really, to any kind of practical application. And this really sounds strange to us today, because I think we're so focused, as they were at that time, the same way we are today, on practical applications, like, are we getting our money's worth for this research? But at this institute, there were no students, so the scholars came in, there were no students, there were no administrative duties, the scholar was just free to pursue knowledge in whatever form they wanted, whatever direction they wanted to go in. And there's a quote here that I think sort of really il illustrates that idea, and it says, is it not a curious fact that in a world steeped in irrational hatreds which threatens civilization itself, men and women, old and young, which detach themselves wholly or partly from the angry current of daily life to devote themselves to the cultivation of beauty, to the extension of knowledge, to the cure of disease, to the amelioration of suffering, just as though fanatics were not engaged simultaneously in spreading pain, ugliness and suffering. So, you know, that is the idea that in at any given time there are those who are working towards the betterment of humanity. And this is written in 1939 
really right on the eve of World War II. So the world was a very troubled place when the essay was written. And I think that he's saying, you know, that there are those out there, and in his mind it would be these scholars at the Institute at Princeton that were working for the advancement of knowledge and thereby for the advancement of civilization and humanity as a whole. So about the practical use, so he, there's a quote here for also from the book around the practicality of this kind of research. And he says, I am not for a moment suggesting that everything that goes on in laboratories will ultimately turn to some unexpected use or that an ultimate practical use is its actual justification. Much more am I pleading for the abolition of the word use and for the freeing of the human spirit. To be sure, we shall thus free some harmless cranks. To be sure, we shall thus waste some precious dollars. But what is infinitely more important is that we shall be striking the shackles off the human mind and setting it free. So he says that this sort of pursuit, sort of knowledge for its own sake, beauty for its own sake, is so important that if we waste a little bit of money along the way, it's worth it down the road. Or if we get some people going off on, on tangents that are really sort of meaningless or a bit cranky, um, that, it's, that is to be expected. But overall, it's to the benefit of us all to pursue this path. So, you know, I thought that was so cool. And this essay really made me think about what is useless knowledge and, you know, how, how useless knowledge enriches our life, really, uh, on an individual level, not so much a scholarly level, but on an individual level, that which provides beauty and meaning to our lives enriches it, right? Even if the world around us might consider that useless, meaning it's not helping us earn a living, but it's providing, it's enriching our lives, and that is a big benefit to me. And I'm sort of applying this to the sense of reading. You know, I've heard people say they only want to read nonfiction because they only have a certain amount of time to read. And so they want to read what's best, what's going to benefit them the most, what they're going to learn from the most. You know, and yeah, you can learn a lot from reading nonfiction. But I think this essay is saying that you can learn by just letting your mind wonder where it actually wants to go, that your mind will actually tell you what it wants to do in order to enrich itself. And that, that if that goes toward nonfiction only, then that's fine. But it's, I think this essay is trying to say that, you know, you can be as enriched reading like Charles Dickens or some other fiction as much as you can by reading a nonfiction sort of work of facts, book of facts, or something that's going to be have a practical application. And not only for fiction versus nonfiction, but really the kind of fiction, you know. Another sort of thing I've heard is people saying, yeah, I don't really read genre fiction, you know, I don't want to waste my time with that. I want to read, you know, real literature or real, you know, uh, literary works. But I think this essay is trying to say that, you know, if your mind wants a mystery, if your mind wants some fantasy or science fiction, let it go off in that direction and see what you can get from it and how it's going to enrich your life. So I think that's, that's just really cool. I think what this essay is really trying to say is that, you know, knowledge and wisdom in your life and life enrichment, it comes from grabbing a bit here and grabbing a bit there and then ultimately synthesizing it all into some sort of expanded understanding or some sort of meaning to you. And I think that's, that's just really a fantastic message. So I think I'll close the chat with this quote, though, about how people never really get make discoveries on their own you know how scientific discovery a lot of times is 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 the credits given to a single person but really the discovery takes many people over decades if not centuries to do and there's a quote here that sort of illustrates that that i thought was pretty cool and it says thus it becomes obvious that one must be wary in attributing scientific discovery wholly to any one person Almost every discovery has a long and precarious history. Someone finds a bit here, another bit there, a third set can, succeeds later, and thus onward till a genius pieces the bits together and makes the decisive contribution. Science, like the Mississippi, 
begins in a tiny rivulet in a distant forest. So, you know, these big scientific greats, these big scholarly greats that we credit with making these big, great breakthroughs really depend on a lot of other people in the past and those around them actually to get to, to synthesize all that knowledge. So I think that's, that's pretty cool too. Okay, I think I'll leave the chat there. You know, this book was a really fast little read, just two essays. But, you know, it was, it was fun read and I got a lot from it. So I'm glad I gave it a read. My next chat, uh, just picking up here, uh, let me just call up the book cover, is going to be Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens. And I have finished this already, so I will have a chat on it coming up soon. Until next time, take care.